Bienvenue à tous. Nous sommes très heureux de vous accueillir pour cette séance exceptionnelle du séminaire littérature de l'Asie du Sud. Je vais laisser Ingrid Le Gargasson et Jeanne miramon bounour vous présenter la soirée. Donc un mot sur l'une et l'autre. Ingrid Le Gargasson est docteur en anthropologie. Sa thèse a porté sur la transmission dans la musique hindoustani. Et Jeanne miramon bounour est docteur en ethnomusicologie. Sa thèse a porté sur la flûte Bansouri. Euh, merci à elle et euh, bonne soirée à vous tous. Voilà. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Bienvenue à tous donc, pour ce concert-conférence avec la chanteuse indienne Ashwini Bhide Deshpande. Donc, cette séance est organisée en fait, dans le cadre euh, du séminaire littérature de l'Asie du Sud, organisé euh, par le projet Delhi, donc Dictionnaire encyclopédique des littératures de l'Inde, pour les quelques personnes qui ne connaîtraient pas encore cet acronyme, et également dans le cadre du 22e Festival de l'Imaginaire, grâce au soutien donc, de la Maison des Cultures du Monde, en partenariat avec euh, la Bulac, que nous remercions euh, de nous accueillir ce soir, et également grâce au soutien de l'affreux monde iranien et indien, que nous tenons également à remercier. Euh, nous remercions bien évidemment aussi euh, Ashwini Bide Deshpande d'avoir accepté de se prêter en fait, à cette discussion euh, publique, puisque c'est quelque chose un petit peu de, de rare quand même de voir un artiste hindoustani, d'avoir de, de euh, l'occasion de parler en fait, de, de son répertoire. Et on trouvait que ce, ce contexte se prêtait plutôt bien euh, à cette occasion. Donc l'idée, c'est qu'elle nous parle euh, à la fois de la poésie mise en musique, des liens entre texte, euh, musique et émotion dans le cadre de la musique hindoustani. Ashwini Bidi Deshpande est donc une euh, interprète de khayal. Le khayala, khayal pardon, est le principal genre vocal de la musique hindoustani. C'est une forme poétique et musicale qui est née dans le cadre de la culture indo-persane à la fin du XVIIe siècle, mais qui euh, vraiment a connu des développements tout au long des siècles suivants. Euh, alors un petit mot pour ceux qui ne seraient pas familiers, la musique hindoustani, donc c'est aussi on l'appelle la, euh, maintenant euh, en tout cas depuis le XXe siècle musique classique de l'Inde du Nord par opposition à la musique classique de l'Inde du Sud qui se nomme musique carnatique et ces deux traditions en fait partagent les mêmes grands concepts qui euh, sont celui de, de rag et de tal. Alors je, je vous conseille de prendre note hein, pour ceux qui ne sont pas familiers puisque je vous donne les termes clés et en fait on va les entendre dans la discussion. Voilà, L'idée c'est que vous, pouvez, euh, vous pourriez suivre ce qui va se, se passer. Donc je disais ces deux traditions euh, classiques partagent le concept de rag qui est le cadre mélodique, donc ce qui est l'équivalent d'un mode avec donc une échelle ascendante, descendante, avec des mouvements caractéristiques des mouvements mélodiques caractéristiques, et le tal, qui est le, le cycle euh, rythmique. Enfin, on aura l'occasion d'aborder ce point euh, plus après. Euh, et donc oui, j'avais oublié de vous dire que le chant créal euh, date du début du XVIIe siècle, mais la tradition orale continue souvent à l'attribuer euh, au poète soufi euh, Amir Khusro, euh, donc du XIIIe, XIVe siècle. Et euh, un petit mot sur la poésie du, du chant krial. En fait, c'est assez court. Un krial se compose de deux vers qu'on nomme le stai et l'antara. Et euh, ces deux vers peuvent se subdiviser en deux, trois ou quatre parties, ce qui fait qu'un qu chant krial tient entre deux et huit lignes. Mais euh, sur ce, ce, ce court en fait, texte, euh, ces courtes paroles, la chanteuse va improviser euh, dans le cadre mélodique et le cadre rythmique entre 15 minutes pour un chota kial, donc un petit kayal, jusqu'à trois quarts d'heure pour un bara kial. Donc je pense qu'elle nous montrera de quelle manière se fait cette improvisation euh, tout à l'heure. Et euh, même si donc, les, les artistes sont spécialistes de chant kial, lors d'un récital de musique hindoustani, de, de chant, il y a, on, on va dire, un, un format un peu standard, en tout cas euh, une convention. On va débuter par un bara kial, donc littéralement grand kial, grand kial, pardon, en euh, tempo lent, voire très lent, vilambit, ati vilambit, qui va être suivi parfois sans césure d'un chota kial, donc un petit kial, en tempo moyen ou rapide. Et ensuite, selon le, le contexte, selon le temps également euh, donné euh, au, au concert, euh, l'artiste va décider de présenter un autre... Euh, alors, le, le chota kial et le bara kial sont dans le même rag, mais souvent sont dans un tal différent, donc même cadre mélodique, mais souvent cadre rythmique euh, euh, différent, donc. Euh, et oui, je ne me suis pas trompée, c'est le même rag, mais différent tal, voilà. <rire> Pardon. Et ensuite, euh, ils vont présenter un, un autre chota kial, souvent, dans un autre rag. 
et euh, passer après à d'autres formes poétiques et, et musicales. Donc souvent, ce sont des formes qu'on qualifie de semi-classiques. Il y a tout un éventail de, de, de formes et également des formes dites euh, dévotionnelles. Et Ashwini Bidedeshpande est notamment reconnu pour son interprétation du bhajan, donc un chant dévotionnel hindou, enfin, c'est un chant de louange à une divinité hindoue, et euh, des abhang, qui est aussi un chant dévotionnel, mais en marathi, donc qui est lié vraiment à la région du Maharashtra. Et souvent, ce sont l'occasion de reprendre des... Enfin, de reprendre. Ce n'est pas le terme qui convient ici, mais ils vont présenter des poésies de grands euh, saints poètes nord-indiens qu'on nomme les saintes euh, et qui datent comme Kabir du 15e siècle, Surdas du 16e siècle, de Mirabai. Pour les Abhang, ce sont tous les saints poètes mystiques liés à la tradition des Varkari. Je ne sais pas si ça vous parle de Omar Ashtra. Et donc, euh, parmi les, les noms reconnus, il y a par exemple Namdev du XIVe siècle, Tukaram, Eknat. Et en fait, toute ces poésies est connue par Ashwini Bidedeshpande par la tradition orale. Et ce qui est vraiment intéressant, puisque peut-être vous, parmi vous, il y a des étudiants du département Asie du Sud qui ont peut-être étudié les recensions écrites. Et on voit ici une approche un peu différente. Euh, même si par ailleurs, euh, les artistes peuvent se référer euh, ensuite aux publications et aux recensions qui existent euh, de, de ces poésies. Mais ici, ils apprennent vraiment dans un cadre euh, mélodique. C'est vraiment des chants, avant toute chose. Euh, voilà, donc ce projet euh, a vraiment été... Donc on, on, Jeanne et moi-même, l'idée de, de ce projet était de montrer la diversité des formes maîtrisées par les artistes hindoustani et de mettre en valeur la circulation des répertoires entre euh, on va dire ce qu'on qualifie des répertoires dits régionaux et dévotionnels avec la musique classique, puisque souvent on qualifie de classique, il y a un peu une hiérarchie implicite et en fait, dans les faits, les artistes vraiment s'inspirent des formes locales. Et il y a vraiment un passage très aisé euh, d'un univers à l'autre. Et euh, Ajini Bidi Deshpande est vraiment, je pense, un, un bon exemple. Et c'est l'idée de cette rencontre ce soir de, de montrer sa de variété. Euh, et l'idée du projet que nous avions dé, pardon, déposé avec la Maison des Cultures du Monde et pour lequel euh, nous avons eu le prix 2017 euh, avec Jeanne, qui nous a permis de réaliser ce, ce projet. Pour nous, c'est un peu un rêve. Donc... <rire> On est ravis de pouvoir le partager avec vous. Et je vais laisser la parole à Jeanne qui va nous parler un peu plus des artistes et de leurs instruments. Merci Ingrid. Effectivement, juste un petit mot sur le caractère un peu particulier de la venue d'Ashwini Bidé Deshpande pour nous, puisqu'elle est aussi la marraine d'un projet qu'on a développé en Inde pour valoriser les jeunes artistes indiens, puisqu'Ingrid et moi-même avons mené nos recherches à Delhi, et partout en Inde, mais enfin surtout à Delhi, avec des artistes qui ont été très généreux dans les échanges, avec qui on a beaucoup partagé. Et pour nous, c'était vraiment très important de, euh, de les faire entendre, de pouvoir euh, faire entendre leur musique. Les faire venir ici, c'est vraiment un privilège. Et euh, voilà, donc vraiment, Ashwini Bidé Deshpande est notre marraine, notre, euh, notre idole aussi en musique hindoustani. Donc c'est vraiment euh, un très grand honneur pour nous. Euh, quelques mots donc, sur euh, les artistes et leurs instruments. Ashwini Bidé Deshpande fait partie d'une famille de musiciens, d'artistes de Mumbai. Elle a appris de sa mère, Manik Bidé, qui est assez rare en fait dans le milieu hindoustani. Et par la suite, elle a suivi l'enseignement d'un grand maître d'une lignée qu'on appelle Garana, qui, est, qui veut dire tradition pour faire rapide, Jaipur Atroli. Bon. On pourra vous expliquer éventuellement tous ces termes durant la discussion. Et elle est une des très grandes représentantes de ce garana, donc de cette tradition musicale, de cette lignée musicale. Et aujourd'hui, une des grandes chanteuses en général du genre créal en Inde. Donc c'est vraiment une chance extraordinaire de l'avoir ici, de l'avoir dans ce contexte où on pourra discuter avec elle et l'entendre parler donc de son lien à la poésie, à la musique, mais aussi... Si elle le veut bien, nous raconter comment elle a appris euh, euh, la musique et son rapport à la transmission et aussi à l'enseignement. Elle est accompagnée donc par deux musiciens euh, euh, que nous avons côtoyés avec Ingrid euh, pendant de nombreuses années à New Delhi. Euh, par exemple, Vinay Mishra, qui l'accompagnera à l'harmonium, le petit orgue portatif que vous voyez là. Euh, nous l'avons connu quand il était encore étudiant et aujourd'hui, il enseigne à l'université de Delhi. Euh, C'est un artiste qui s'est intéressé à l'histoire de son instrument, qui a écrit une thèse sur euh, l'harmonium. 
c'est aussi un des aspects euh, euh, tout à fait euh, fascinants euh, de, de cet artiste que nous recevons. Et puis, au tablin, elle, elle sera accompagnée par Vinod Lélé, qui est un artiste euh, avec lequel elle a aussi l'habitude euh, de jouer, de chanter, euh, qui joue donc cette paire de tambours que vous voyez là sur la droite de la scène, enfin, à gauche pour vous. Il est euh, également euh, enseignant euh, à New Delhi, si je ne m'abuse, oui. Et donc, deux mots sur ces instruments. L'harmonium, euh, qui est donc ce petit orgue portatif, est un instrument qui est arrivé assez récemment dans la pratique de la musique hindoustanie. Euh, il s'est généralisé euh, autour de, de la fin du 19e siècle et surtout au 20e siècle. Et il a remplacé, en quelque sorte, pas tout à fait complètement, mais quand même beaucoup, euh, la vielle qu'on appelle sarangi, qui est un instrument euh, donc à archer. Et le rôle de cet instrument est avant tout un instrument d'accompagnement qui suit la ligne mélodique. Il va donc, comme vous l'entendrez, répéter vraiment tous les détails de la ligne mélodique qui sera chantée par, par la soliste. Et puis, de temps en temps, il va lui-même improviser et orner autour de, du raga qu'elle aura choisi d'interpréter. Pour la paire de tambours, le tabla que vous voyez ici, c'est vraiment l'instrument... Euh, caractéristique euh, percussif de la musique hindoustani. Euh, il n'y a pas de pratique euh, de crial sans, euh, sans un joueur de tabla. Euh, C'est une percussion donc, qui, est qui est composée de deux tambours avec la particularité euh, euh, organologique euh, d'une pastille euh, que vous verrez sur le dessus euh, de la peau de chèvre. C'est une pastille noire qui est composée de, de différents éléments, notamment de poudre de fer, et qui permet donc une sonorité très euh, particulière, d'avoir une variété de, de sonorités extraordinaires que euh, Vinod Lélé vous fera entendre euh, sans aucun doute. Voilà, donc quelques mots sur les instruments. Et je vais ajouter deux, trois mots sur peut-être oui, comment va se dérouler notre, euh, notre soirée. Puis je m'arrêterai là. Donc, euh, nous allons d'abord euh, entrer dans la musique, laisser les artistes euh, prendre place sur scène. Euh, pendant une dizaine de minutes, vous présenteront euh, ce qu'ils auront choisi de, de vous présenter. Puis ensuite, nous inviterons donc euh, Ashwini Bité Deschwandé à nous rejoindre sur scène et euh, sur, euh, enfin, autour de la table et euh, avoir une discussion donc, sur son répertoire, sur sa musique. Et ensuite, nous vous donnerons la parole pour un échange euh, de questions-réponses. Alors, la table ronde se déroulera en anglais. Euh, nous veillerons à traduire les termes peut-être euh, spécifiques qu'elle utilisera euh, liés à la musique. Et puis, si vous souhaitez poser des questions en français, c'est tout à fait possible. Nous, nous nous occuperons de faire la traduction. Voilà, je vous souhaite une... On finira donc en musique par question. Merci. Okay, voilà, merci. on finit en musique. Merci bien. Alors, je vous prie d'accueillir Ashwini Bidé Deshpande, au chant. Vinod Lélé au tabla. Vinay Mishra à l'harmonium et Ashish Verma au tempura. talk about it after I'm done. This is based on Raga Hansatwani.
Thank you so much for such a beautiful performance. Um, maybe to start the discussion, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about what you just sang? You told us it was a bhajan on Kabir's poetry? Yes, and uh, like in all his um, approach to life, he talks about passion and devotion. Lagan is devotion or passion. And he says, Lagan bin jagena nirmohi, the Lord is not to be awakened, sons. Lagan, sans passion. So, Bina Lagan ki preet bavari, o sunir jodhoi. Without passion or devotion, preet is love, of course, is of no use. It will um, fall off like a dew drop. <laughs> so. Inspiring. And, um, sorry, you want to ask Can a question? Uh, I, I was curious from uh, whom you learned this Kabir Bajan and the previous one you present this uh, weekend. <laughs> if you uh, have a special guru for the Bajan and Abhang you are performing, or if you can you tell us about the transmission of this <laughs> Bajan? Yes, I have uh, um, I have kind of inherited the um, Abhang singing from my mother. Oh. She is the composer of many of my Abhang compositions. Oh. But I have to tell you that we have a um, we have an age-old tradition of almost 800 years of the abhang singing in in the part of India where I come from, and we can talk about it in detail later on mm -hmm. because it restricts to my region, the Maharashtra mm -hmm. and the Marathi language. But we can talk about it in detail later on. Mm -hmm. But as regards the other bhajans like the Kabir poetry or the other Mira bhajans or um, the other bhajans which I'm singing. I have learned them from someone called Ninu Bhai Mujumdar. He was a uh, he was a scholar of saint poetry. He was himself writing and composing uh, uh, devotional songs. The, the one which I presented over the weekend, that is also a Kabir bhajan, and that was my own composition, but this one is not mine. So means uh, the other Kabir Bajan, you took the poetry yes. and choose the rag and put it in the music. Yes. And how did you choose the rag? Just 
curiosity how you have i think it comes from the mood of the uh, of the lyric so that inspires the so tune you, you hear the poetry and it makes you think of one specific rag yes. is it in links with them um, because some rag are linked maybe the audience doesn't know but linked with some specific time of the day so if um, the poetry not necessarily in in bhajans or in devotional music we don't restrict to the time of the day okay. but the mood of the rag hmm. or um, the mood of the lyric and the mood connected with the lyric uh -huh. that is close to my uh, knowledge and my heart that is rag sangeet hmm. and that rag i will choose but let me also um, clarify that in bhajan it is not necessary that we remain restricted to one rag yes like for example i was singing the rag uh, the bhajan based on rag hansadvani mm -hmm. and um, uh, in the middle of the bhajan i was digressing into rag shankara and mm -hmm. because it is not purely rag uh, that we are presenting it is the devotion or it is the feeling emotion mm -hmm. behind the words that we are presenting Mm -hmm. So it is not necessary that I must restrict to the rag. It can be based on a particular rag, but it need not. It can digress a little. Okay. So when you learned from um, uh, your mother, for example, she she taught you the poetry um, with the rag together, and this yes. is something will you will always link. Um, or would you um, set uh, poetry on another rag, or just um, understand? Uh, well, much depends on. See, I have this habit of reading old saint poetry, mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. getting the books and just going on reading the poetry. Mm. So when reading the poetry, there is a kind of imagery that uh, appears in front of my eyes or in inside my mind. And I will try and remain faithful to that feeling that arises right. when I'm reading the poetry. Right. Sometimes I cannot relate to the... Uh, the emotion of the saint poet mm. or the poet in general but i can imagine what he is trying to say right. maybe i cannot relate i cannot see myself in his situation but uh, i can imagine and that is that, that is where the um, uh, uh, the imaginary world comes into play is that um Uh, sp uh, specific to your um, lineage, uh, or to your mother, or is it no. very is quite sp uh, unique is quite in you? Um, no, no, this is quite general. Okay, what I mean is that um, being so much into the poetry among singers is something that many singers um, uh, do, or is it? I something think many singers do. Okay, yes. <laughs> But you have composed many khayal that I don't think everyone is doing. Not I mean, sure. uh, like I have bring. Uh, And the volume yeah. here, uh, Ashwiniji has published uh, two volumes yes. with your um, composition. It's not only Khayal, few other uh, forms are there. Very few, it? yeah. Yes. Uh, I think there are 86 uh, compositions here, mm. but only three are uh, different, different than <laughs> Khayal. <laughs> yes. And I wanted to know, uh, because uh, even if some other singers have done that, uh, I don't think, uh, means still, it's, it's not that common. Yeah. Maybe you can explain us why you feel the need at some point to create your own composition yes. and not performing only the traditional one that we call it Harinadar or Paramparik Bandish yeah. and explain what was uh, your motivation behind this. Yeah. Certainly. This is, um, see, we have the Khayal Parampara started sometime 500, 600 years ago. Mm. Although it tradition, started much sorry. earlier. The parampara tradition, the tradition of uh, Khayal. Tradition of Khayal singing. Mm. It is, um, maybe it, came on the forefront maybe 500, 600 years ago. Before that, it was considered um, uh, something like, you know, uh, it was not as uh, sacred or as important as Drupad singing. Yes. Drupad singing mm, was, was much yes. more considered classical art. Just Whereas Drupad, maybe just a word, is another genre um, in Hindustani music, uh, vocal genre. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, really, really the the important classical art. Mm -hmm. But um, when the when the art got out of the temple tra tradition, 
in the courts of the rulers mm-hmm. then it started becoming more khayal oriented more uh, that more liberalized mm-hmm. and that is when the uh, khayal uh, genre developed like developed yeah. and i today it is yeah today it is the uh, reigning form of uh, um, indian classical music north indian classical music and in these 500 600 plus years we have composers from various generations composing their own khayal bandishes and adding to the pool of khayal compositions and i have always grown up listening to very solid rock solid traditional khayal compositions and there was no, nothing wrong uh, in taking them up <laughs> i still do uh, um, take up beautiful they are they're really beautiful bandishes beautiful compositions sometime somewhere during the course of journey of my uh, uh, khayal uh, progress process whatever you may call i realized that i have this ability of saying things which i want to say in my own words mm. and it becomes simple for me to convey my own feeling in my own words rather than borrowing somebody's language and somebody's form to convey my emotion mm. that is when um, i realized that i have this potential of uh, composing bandishes composing uh, khayal compositions but i don't compose for the sake of composing it has to be inspired it has to come from within and i wait for it to happen to me okay. so that's why there are few bandishes that there are not many mm-hmm. i don't compose a bandish every day mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's the um, you would compose the poetry first yes and then think uh, of no the music there is no hard and fast rule to how a bandish okay. will come into existence mm-hmm. it it can be some a poetic statement mm-hmm. and uh, then it might sometimes it just comes together the the melodic and the poetic, and the poetic. Uh, sometimes it's the melody that keeps ringing in my ears first and then i have to search for the words to fit into that melody yes. sometimes it's the word it's the idea and then i have to find proper appropriate rag and tal or a, a statement to fit to be suitable for that mm. uh, so it much depends sometimes i have to make efforts to make the words fit into the melodic uh, that's that's a hard <laughs> <laughs> maybe you can say uh, something about the the language the braj because mm, i'm not sure everyone is familiar with it can you tell something about the language yes braj bhasha braj the language that is spoken majorly in the northern part of india around mathura vrindavan agra so this particular language is the one that is used for in all the bhajans in all the khayals and in most of the uh, uh, classic poetry for the last 500 600 years even today we are using the same language yes, for yes you are composing in braj <laughs> yes i'm composing in braj i haven't learned the language but yes. since i have grown up with the language and i have always used that language as my tool for communication i think i think i have a fair control over the language mm-hmm. it's not about making a talk in that language it's about saying what you want to say in minimum words in that language mm-hmm. and that comes very easily i think because the language itself is very very flexible mm-hmm. you can change it according to the mood that you want to want it to suit now i i can give you i can i can give you a very small example here uh, the word badal which actually means um, cloud mm-hmm. now this is a masculine word badar badal can become badar but when used in braj it can be used in several ways it can be badra it can be badarwa it can be badarwa it can be badri it can be badriya it can be badriya so when 
when whichever of a purpose i want to use the word for i can twist the word accordingly when i want to address to the cloud as if i'm angry with the cloud and i want the cloud to go away because it is blocking me from meeting my beloved i will call it ja ja re badarwa go away badarwa then it is badarwa but when the same cloud is somewhere is like my friend is like my girlfriend whom i am confiding my love with then it is badar ya barsere saiya so i can twist it to suit my shade of emotion and this particular uh, i think the word itself badal or badar itself is a hard word but you can make it very soft and very melodic by calling it badra badarwa so same way you have uh, when you want to call your beloved dear priya priya is a hard word but when you want to call address the beloved in braj bhasha it becomes piya piyu piyava piyarva piharva yes you can play with the, yes. the sonority the sound of the yeah <laughs> Actually, this is also the way you will treat the note because the note yes, can exactly. be attacked very softly. Yeah, or you can link two notes in a very soft way, or on the contrary. Also, they will help me fit the thing in the in the tal cycle. Yes, because mm-hmm. pu may not be sufficient. Mm-hmm. Then I want a longer word for pu. Uh-huh. Then I can make it p harva uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to make it fit into the tal cycle. so you spend um uh is it something that uh, you just let according to your mood as you say it is coming like this or is it, it is coming i i have no i mean i don't do it by design mm-hmm. it happens because it reflects my own emotions and my own feelings at that time mm-hmm. so it comes according to the feeling it doesn't i mean i don't make it by design i understand <laughs> I maybe uh, ask you one last question before we open the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Last time I I, I met you, I, I bothered you with a question um, regarding the Ras theory, this aesthetic uh, theory uh, very um, common in India uh, regarding every art. And I was asking you how uh, you relate today the Ras theory in Hindustani music, and how do you relate uh, the rag, the text, and the bhav, the emotion. and uh, you tell me very interesting things about the expression of emotion in uh, khayal to call you tell us about uh, this point and about what you think about this ras or if it's no um, meaning for you today um, this category this theoretical aspect of it see when we are talking about emotion we are talking about specific emotions say for example when i'm saying that piya nahi aaye jiya ghabraye so verbally translated it means my beloved is um, not arriving on time and so i am feeling restless or i am feeling scared i'm i mean so literally translated it is this but when we are singing it is not the it is not the single emotion that we are singing it is a spectrum of emotions and that is ras so the ras is basically uh we have nine rasas nine rasas and uh, um, only four out of the nine are good rasas the five are uh, uh, they are so difficult to um, even experience and uh, express yeah so the uh, the uh, the ones like um, shringar um veer valor shringar so shringar. can explain yes um, romantic so yeah shringar is romantic basically karuna is compassion uh veer is um, valor raudra is anger adbhuta is um, i don't know i don't say wonder wonder wonderment bhayanaka is something that will scare me off bibhatsa is um, something that will 
generate uh, <laughs> bad feelings within me vibhatsa so all these rasas are very difficult to uh, portray in art but what you portray by saying piya nahi aaye ja ghabraye is not just bhayanaka is not just scare but it also means anxiety it also means jealousy why is my beloved not coming because there might be somebody who is holding him back etc etc so there are there is a there are shades of emotion in a rasa and veera can be coupled with raudra so if something angers you then you feel like fighting for it so veera and raudra these are rasas they are connected something that first of all will scare you might anger you and then you can go and fight for it so all these rasas are connected and i feel i mean this is written down in the old sanskrit texts that basically there are only two rasas the uh, good and the bad the uh, sukh and uh, dukh um, so sorrow yeah. and joy so there are only uh, uh, two basic emotions and everything comes as a result of uh, several um, small variations shades of emotions yes. yeah okay. this is something you um, teach to your students sorry last question and then <laughs> <laughs> you know these things are not taught <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> great so we'll uh, open we'll take a few questions please don't hesitate to ask meanwhile i can ask you while uh, the first person will uh, question there <laughs> ah someone the mic is coming to <laughs> hi thank you uh, how about improv in all you 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 are doing i didn't get your question ah, improvisation improvisation yes uh, so in in indian classical music the raga system is such that it's based on a choice of notes right i i hope you know this that we choose a set of notes and uh, uh, remain restricted within that set of notes and try portraying an emotion so there are um i mustn't say rules but there are um, traditionally conventions associated with particular set of notes being associated with a particular emotion like for example there are very flat many flat notes in a particular rag that rag is more likely to be uh, karuna compassion oriented than it being romantic so such uh, uh um, generalizations are there so when i begin singing a particular rag i usually start off by expecting the expected because uh if i have chosen if i have chosen a particular rag because i'm not feeling too good today i have chosen a karuna rasa pradhan rag but on my course of Uh, improvisation in that rag somehow that karuna ras takes a back seat and somehow i start feeling good it happens it is not supposed to happen but it happens the rag has the power to you know uh, 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 to dictate these things and i feel that i cannot be like a be like a um, script writer who will write a script like you know uh, 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 like a, a role in a film i cannot write a script uh, uh, telling my rag what to do and what to say and things so rag is something more than that rag is something living it will tell me what to do and it will tell me along the progression what it wants me to do so i think i must listen to what the rag is telling me to do and do it can the rag tell you to leave him and to change the yes rag? yes of <laughs> course of course we heard that sometimes <laughs> the change of the rag in the middle of a, yes um, so like if i i want if i have taken up a rag because i want to take up 
and i realize that it's not happening the chemistry is not yes coming together it's just not going the way i want it to go then i have to close it i cannot take mm. up a fight with the rag right. because i have to go according to what the rag tells me mm. to do i cannot say that you do what i want you to do no mm. <laughs> then i have to give it up and i have to try something else something else right as a question that's exactly the basis of improvisation i feel oh, that's it that i decide on the on the dot of the on that moment whether i want to what i want to do so rag like for you as like uh, like person yes. some you you like some you dislike yes, yes. <laughs> any question good evening uh, you've been you've been saying that you've been learning a lot from your mother uh, what about the transmission of your art today in india do you think there is a new generation do you think this art is uh, well uh, transmitted yes luckily fortunately we are all in my generation all the artists are working hard towards making more more students and transmitting the art and luckily for us we have a very bright disciple population <laughs> the younger population is very good they are very hard working and they are not just smart they are um, ready to work for it with their soul devoted yes. devoted yeah yeah very positive <laughs> it's good yeah yeah <laughs> oh that's true that um um concert festivals and performances of uh, hindustani uh, music are often uh, full and uh, there is a big audience yes. uh, we always worry here uh, for traditional music or western classical music that the um, um, the music will not attract the younger generation but uh, mm -hmm. i guess in india the um, relation with the uh, the music in general is quite uh, different so you don't feel like it's uh, going away it's no. still very much alive yes that's great <laughs> And how many disciples you have? Maybe you can tell us if you have. At it. any point of time, I think not more than three or four. Okay. But uh, they keep changing. It's a floating population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for these beautiful moments. I was on the concert on Sunday. <laughs> We went flew. <laughs> We flew with you to some place, secret place, <laughs> certainly. Thank This you. is a very classical question. What about the place of women and men in, in this Hindustani music? Um, it seems that men are more in instruments, or um, what would you say about that? No, I don't think so, not anymore. Some 50, uh, 80 years ago, there used to be uh, uh, this line that divided between the, uh, the men and the women in the, you know, the women from, <coughs> from um, the educated women rather they wanted to go for education rather than for art pursuit but not anymore i think now it is more of a liberal kind of an attitude and uh, um, there was a time when if a woman sang very well she was she was always compared with the men and kesar bai like for example kesar bai kherkar one of my gharana stalwarts she sang so well that they used to call her they used to say that she sings like a man <laughs> so that was a that was a compliment given to her not anymore <laughs> after if we can add something it's true that maybe vocal is more popular with uh, students of uh, with a girl in a, an instrument still like tabla is still very less women practicing tabla i will say some <laughs> instruments are still uh, more popular among uh, men <laughs> maybe <laughs> <laughs> means if you see in music school for example it's quite uh, obvious means in the institution i visit i will yeah, say yeah. that you will see khayal classes full of uh, women Mm. Uh, two three men and uh, if you go to tabla i don't know where is vinod mostly you have many many boys more than more than girls so yeah. still is there but obviously the things have changed a lot since 50 years it's true and now more women are also picking up the instruments but it's a slow uh, change it takes time it is it, it is takes, it takes time mm. yeah, and some uh, wind instruments are very uh, 
there is few very few female like, practicing wind instruments, but sitar, maybe sarod, a little violin. bit more now. Violin, also. violin, yes, yes, violin. So should we take one, uh, one more here. question before getting back to the music? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you were talking about composing the poetry. Is it usually your poetry or do you intend to compose the Western poetry or other countries? Do you interest in other poetry to compose or doesn't work with your music? No. In, 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 in Khal, we need very uh, minimal poetry. Like I said, it is about the improvisation part that we bring out the, the spectrum of emotions more. I mean, the poetry is two lines of the first, uh, 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 the, the first half of the song and two lines of the second half, of the, the higher uh, half of the song. And the poetry ends over there. But the poetry is really, like I said, it is very, very general kind of uh, 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 emotion, which will only help me to put my step into the realm of the feeling, which is so very wide, far and wide. And once I enter into the realm of the rag, which is huge, which is uh, um, which is like an ever-expanding horizon. So after that particular step has been taken, then the poetry takes a um, back seat. And it is the abstract idea, the alap. Have you talk, talked about the alaps? No, not really. Le prélude, voilà, non mesuré, où c'est l'introduction du, du rag, en fait, de ces mouvements. Et donc, c'est la partie où il n'y a pas d'accompagnement euh, instrumental et il n'y a pas non plus de, de paroles. So you are actually doing the emoting part with the help of notes. Mm -hmm. It is like romancing the notes. So taking the notes step by step, one after another, progressing into the octave from low to high and from slow to fast. That is how you build up the rag. And that is that doesn't really require the poetry then afterwards. It is only for my stepping stone to enter into the realm of the rag. It helps me like a stepping stone. But it takes a back seat after that. So poetry is really, really very, very minimalistic. So all I need is, uh, like I said, a couplet in the, in the lower half of the composition and a couplet in the... Uh, um, second half of the composition, that's all. But this is for Khayal, because I guess this for other, like Thumri, Dadara, Bajan, the, the text is more important, isn't it? Yes, but not as important as in Bhajan. Yes. Because in Bhajan, okay. also again, it is not the text that you're singing, it is the devotion that you're singing. Mm. So Actually, the, uh, the words is uh, like a conduct to drive you to, through the emotion and then after you yeah. get So it's basically uh, flowing in the river hmm. and the words are only your boat. Yes, <laughs> that's beautiful. But I think Sarah, you were also asking about if she's writing poetry without being sung, no? C'était pas aussi la question de savoir si elle compose, enfin, écrivait de la poésie sans les chanter? Non, c'était si elle composerait en français, sur une poésie en français, par exemple, c'est ça? She is wondering if you would... Composed, be inspired by um, a French poetry, for example. Yeah, yeah. If you could do that. Uh, like I just said that I need my language, the Braj Bhasha, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, uh, to be flexible in the way I cannot do. I cannot play with uh, another language with the same kind of ease unless I know yeah. that language. Haiku, for example, yeah, yeah. Haiku yeah, yeah. Japanese yeah, I know language. Japanese haikus. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It would be very new. Okay. Oui. Yes, please. 
Uh, hello, this question stems from the discussion we were having when you say that the rag dictates and the poetry takes a back seat. How much importance will you give to the poetic aspect and to the melodic aspect? Because when we sing a khayal, we have to think about so many technical aspects, the notes and so many other things, the emotion, the feelings. And do we, uh, does, I mean, really we have uh, time to give, I mean, importance to the poetry. How much, how much importance is it for you? I think to me, the poetic as well as the melodic aspects are not as important as the emotional aspect of the rag. The emotional aspect is the most important aspect. So it's not only the mel melody. So there are like three things in it. Well, in I thing. have known artists who have gone to the extent of breaking the rules of the rag if they have gone into the emotion of the rag. Mm. So the rag doesn't dictate in that case. Yeah. Rag itself dictates. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rag wants that swar, okay, that yeah. note, note over there. Thank you. It was the last question. I think everyone wants more music. Yes, we'll go back <laughs> to the music. So, okay, thank you very much to have a My pleasure, it's question. been really, really uh, pleasurable to be talking like this in an institute uh, dedicated to the languages. Yes. <laughs> so now I invite the artists back on stage and Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. I will take your microphone. Okay, now I have chosen uh, the Khayal Zundra. And uh, just for you to be able to compare the, uh, the bhajan and the Khayal genres, I have chosen a similar emotion in the khayal genre. Um, the rag is slightly different. The rag is Yaman and it is Momana Lagan Lagi. The, uh, this is the text of the slow tempo khayal which we call Vilambit Bada Khayal. And um, this I will do without the tabla accompaniment because I would want you to um, relate to the rag mood, rag emotion, and which is of that of devotion again, but in the khayal form. And then I will uh, go on to a fast composition with the tabla in the same rag. Mm -hmm.
and now i want to conclude this session with a very interesting uh, uh, piece that we call tarana this particular uh, composition does not have any uh, meaningful words no meaningful poetry but the words are melodic they don't carry any verbal meaning but they carry some melodicity and these words are borrowed from the language of other instruments now you must wonder when i say language of other instruments what does that mean now tabla for example has a language when tabla is played there are sounds emanating from the two drums and those sounds need to be spoken or they need to be given identity so uh, uh, sounds like na dha tete dhage tirakita so these sounds have i mean this is the language of tabla and uh, may i ask you to say the language of tabla so what she says can you give him the mic so, please <coughs> this is very interesting when he says the language he can actually play those sounds from the from the drums so you must first hear him say the language and then hear him play so what exactly we say uh, word so same we try to produce the sound from the, these two drums actually it is the other yeah. way around the sound is produced and that you give the uh, syllables yes, so, to <laughs> so for the for you i am telling this yeah, yeah, yeah. in a opposite way because <laughs> what i am saying i am producing this but otherwise this is language first the sound is coming yeah mm. so <clears throat> like she says there are dha so there are both combined the hands in a one particular time i am stroking this and it's uh, sounding like dha dha and there are single single words first like dha te te na tun dhe tin then we combine two sounds like dhe te dhage tuna katta dhage then three sound combined dhe te te 1 2 3 then four sound combined tirakita dhage tete hena tuna kat tete so and now uh, in all these uh, sounds we can produce a sentence like a composition so i am saying one small composition to you with this tabla धागे तेटे तागे तेटे धातरी गिट तक तातरी गिट तक धागे तेटे तागे तेटे धातरी गिट तक तातरी गिट तक धातरी गिट तक धाती धा धातरी गिट तक धा क्रांग धा कत धा धातरी गिट तक धा क्रांग धा कत धा धातरी गिट तक धा क्रांग धा कत धा like this is this is the language of tabla we have language of the string instruments we have the language of the sitar dadir dara and so so the vocalists will borrow from these languages and make a composition that is called as tarana and i am going to present the tarana in rag bhairavi for you and uh, because it is not supposed to mean anything it will only uh, uh, it is the melodicity of the words that you will enjoy and uh, maybe the melodic meaning
Nah, dir 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 